Nuclear war, superintelligence, pandemics, pollution, and climate change. What do these all have in common? The meta crisis. Welcome. This talk is an introduction to the meta crisis, which is a theory of the pervasive, interrelated, and underlying drivers of our intensifying 21st century crises, particularly global catastrophic risk. My name is Josh. And my goal with this project is to provide a summary for those of you that are familiar with the term and could use a crystallized, condensed version of the metacrisis, or people who have never heard of it before, or maybe have heard the term and aren't really sure what it is. This is just a draft. I would probably never finish it if I tried to include everything and at the end of the talk, I want to do a brief note on a request to you, the audience, um, about an experiment I want to run for us to do a bit of collective intelligence around this presentation. Once again, uh, this is a synthesis. It is not another hot take to add to the pile. There's a lot of terms, a lot of talks, a lot of ideas out there related to this and I don't want to add something else. I want to condense it all together into one place. There's going to be an increasing need, I think, for us to have metacrisis literacy and hopefully this presentation helps with that effort. The reason I think it's going to be important is we have to be better at communicating these ideas to audiences that aren't familiar um, and don't usually pay attention to risks like this. Quick disclaimers, um, I made this independently myself. The writing in here, the opinions in here do not represent those of any of my employers. And also I take accountability for any of the misrepresentations of the reference works. If I get it wrong, that's that's me, and I'm looking forward to your feedback on that. All right, so there's three parts to this. The first part, I'm gonna go through the global risk landscape, talk through some relative relevant terms you may have heard, different classifications, what are the greatest challenges, what I'm calling compounding risk factors. And then part two, I'm gonna talk about what the metacrisis is itself. Get into the underlying forces of risk, generative dynamics, and this idea of there being a dilemma where we try to solve all of this without causing more harm. Finally, part three will be mostly my assessment of what I'm seeing as humanity's response, um, what I think we as individuals can do, and a concept called cathedral thinking that I really like and think we could use a lot more of. There are some bits in here that are striked through. Um, those are slides that will be available online only, and I'll mention them briefly as I go throughout the talk today. Part one, global risk landscape at a glance. So here are some relevant terms you may have heard before. Each one I think is a different frame on the metacrisis. You could think of it like a Venn diagram where each of these is a circle and overlapping to different degrees, capturing parts of the same content, but not entirely. The metacrisis is probably the widest, most inclusive of all of these terms, and maybe a close contender would be the meaning crisis. So let's talk through each one of these briefly. The perma crisis is referring to this idea of there being an extended period of time where we are facing crisis. And it might even go as far as to say that the state of civilization or, or the way it is, is always going to be in crisis. The, the poly crisis is probably the most well-known term, uh, particularly in international development. This term speaks particularly to the idea of there being systemic or compounding interrelated effects between risks. So it's the notion that we 
shouldn't necessarily solve climate change or another issue in isolation. We have to consider them systemically because the worsening conditions in one of those risks could cascade to another and another. Um, Jonathan Rawson actually just did a, a released a really great publication on the distinction between poly crisis and meta crisis. I encourage you to check that out. Climate crisis, arguably the most known. Um, this is the effects of climate change, which are numerous, famine, biodiversity, desertification, so on and so forth. This is a crisis today, and it is also a catastrophic risk in the future. Um, and I'll talk more about what that means on the next slide. The meaning crisis. This is, like I said, another really expansive term. Uh, briefly put, it is referring to the culmination of a civilizational or anthropogenic series of events that have led us up to this realization that what we're doing today collectively is unwise. And finally, the epistemic crisis or sense-making crisis. This refers to the widespread degradation of our ability to collectively make sense of reality. This is due to technology, to political polarization, uh, computational propaganda, and a breakdown of socio-cultural coherence. Classifications of global challenges. So these are six different terms that I've come across that are different ways or different lenses that we can look at global challenges. The first is a distinction between anthropogenic and naturally caused. Anthropogenic just meaning human caused. Um, the metacrisis concept probably most focuses on anthropogenic risk, but that's not to say that naturally caused risks aren't part of it. The way we look at it through the metacrisis lens might be a little different. And briefly put, it is that things like asteroid impacts, supervolcanic eruptions, solar storms, and pandemics, while they may not be human caused, solving them or mitigating them is a task of humanity. And the metacrisis is in the way of us coordinating around them. Next, we have global catastrophic risk and global crises or disasters. So global catastrophic risk is the notion of a global scale destructive event that could occur threatening human survival. This does not mean the extinction of all of humanity, which is the way to contrast it with the next set, which is existential risk. Coming back, global crises and disasters. These are sort of ongoing issues that we have today. You can think of you know, financial crises, famine, um, humanitarian crises, so on. Problems that are already afflicting the world, primarily in um, emerging economies. Disaster, I included that on here as also a contrast to global catastrophic risk in that you could think of increasing natural hazards and disasters that are incurring uh, because of climate change and I'm sure other factors, but these are happening at a more localized scale. They're very destructive for the communities that it is happening to, but it is not a global scale destructive event that threatens all of humanity. So finally, rounding out the last example, uh, existential risk or X risk is, as I mentioned, it's a complete and irreversible human extinction event versus suffering risk, which is the notion that the, the species will persist, um, but it's probably not a situation where any of us wants to be around in a situation where we are suffering. Um, now this includes suffering in the typical sense. It might also include suffering in the sense of taking away all agency. So you can imagine a dystopia in which we are forced to do everything that we do. And that is also a form of suffering. Lastly, suffering risk also refers to all life on Earth, all animals, not necessarily just people. What are the greatest challenges of our time? 
So here's an incomplete list. I'm sure there are others I could have included, but I think this is a pretty good set of the biggest issues that we need to pay attention to related to the metacrisis. On the left-hand side, we have global catastrophic risk, which as I mentioned, is large scale destructive events that threaten most of humanity. I've color coded the left-hand column of global catastrophic risks or GCRs in yellow to identify them as mostly anthropogenic, meaning human caused. The next group is colored in orange, meaning mostly natural caused. You could argue that the ones that I've labeled as naturally caused are worsened by humanity, but for the most part, these have been around before industry. There's also little tags for X risk and S risk. And so you'll notice that the whole box of GCRs includes both the potential to create an extinction event or just uh, suffering, which is not just, but uh, wouldn't be the total and utter annihilation of the species. Global crises and disaster risks, as I mentioned, these are ongoing today. So you'll, you'll recognize a lot of these, and these are also issues that are talked about in the World Economic Forum Risk Report um, and many other reputable reports that I'll link to in the online document. Compounding factors, increasing total risk. So this is a term that I've come up with to capture a bunch of different topics that I've noticed in this space. So the first category of risk factors is systemic vulnerabilities. This is the idea of situations or structures of our civilization that are increasing risk exposure. I think the polycrisis term, which is, as I mentioned, one of the most well known related to the metacrisis, uh, typically refers to this notion of there being systemic vulnerabilities. The second one is coordination constraints. I've noticed a, a whole number of different problems that are out there that are making us less likely to cooperate and less likely thereby to mitigate risk. Finally, we have total risk accelerants. You could probably guess what I would include in this category. Um, and this includes factors that are intensifying the rate at which total risk increases. Total risk meaning the combined probability of all risks. Um, lastly, I'll note that each of the risks here or the compounding risk factors I would say are created by the the aspects of the metacrisis. And not only is it created by the metacrisis, but there is a recursive element where these dynamics are increasing the severity of the metacrisis. So systemic vulnerabilities. Um, I probably could have included some others here, but I think the two most prominent include supply chain globalization and looming energy scarcity. So with the first, we saw this in COVID-19. The shutdown of businesses in one part of the world cascaded through global supply chains to prevent goods and products from being bought in other parts of the world. Furthermore, this global fragility is also seen with global commodity markets. So in the wake of the Ukraine-Russia war, energy prices skyrocket. Next, looming energy scarcity. So this is most in reference to Nate Hagen's work on energy blindness. So this is the idea that we fail to recognize the rate at which we are increasing energy consumption. It's something like 17 trillion watts annually is what we use as energy to power everything in the world. And this number is only increasing, especially with population growth. But what is not um, happening correspondingly is a increase in energy resources we are actually depleting the pool of energy, namely fossil hydrocarbons that exist. And 
the question is how long can this go on for but it is certainly due to the the risk and the sort of the foresight of that risk being there having effects today creating economic vulnerability coordination constraints is as i mentioned these contemporary complications that are making us less likely to cooperate on these major issues so the first harmful tech design is referring mostly to the work from tristan harris and the center for humane technology this is the idea that we're designing technology yes with great benefits and and useful innovation but because we are myopically or narrow-mindedly designing this technology, it is also having negative consequences or it is manipulating us and taking advantage of the physiological systems within us. So it is potentially weakening our memory, increasing sensationalism, causing mental health issues, so on and so forth. The next one, Fifth generation warfare actually goes hand in hand with harmful tech design and, and they both together are creating coordination constraints where fifth generation warfare is this new sort of post cold war non-kinetic military action such as social engineering, misinformation, cyber attacks, and now with AI, we can increasingly create uh, propaganda bots, misinformation, uh, deep fakes, so on and so forth, eroding the shared consensus of our information landscape. And so together, harmful tech and fifth gen warfare are making it much, much harder for us to agree and to thereby cooperate. Um, next two, we have institutional mistrust and coordination failures. So this is the idea, um, which is really well captured by the Edelman Trust Barometer, which they do every year, shows that something like 50% of people actually believe their government says truthful things. That's a daunting figure. And I think in a way I sort of sympathize um, and that's captured by this next point of coordination failures. It makes sense that we sort of don't believe our major institutions when time and time again, we see them indulging in bad faith communication, failing to regulate and neglecting pressing issues. We've been talking about climate change for decades upon decades before I was even born, and we still have rising, I think even doubling emissions since that conversation began. Next, intergenerational education crisis. So this is also um, referring to Zach Stein's work, the idea that our education system and our education paradigm is somewhat obsolete. It is not preparing the next generation to keep up with the pace of technological change. It is hyper-focused on specialization when people should be learning more cross-cutting ideas. And it's related to this notion of a decline in civic virtue, in civic engagement, where my generation and future generations are probably less interested in the governance of their own society are increasingly tuned out of politics. Um, there's a way in which political polarization is capturing everything, but also a way in which participation in the actual process of governance is declining. And this goes probably hand in hand with the fact that trust in institutions is declining. Finally, total risk accelerant. This is artificial intelligence and it is intensifying the rate of total risk increase. Um, this is due to maybe two factors. One is the techno-capitalist status quo. So even in the default hands, not landing in the hands of some evil dictator, we are probably gonna be continuing to innovate in ways that are narrow-minded and myopic, ignoring the potential consequences and negative effects of what we invest in. In addition to that, there is explicit use of AI that could be harmful, such as AI to invent bioweapons, to exacerbate fifth gen warfare, to manipulate the media, increase digital surveillance, and any myriad way to exploit life on the planet further. Okay, so that's a lot of talk, um, but you might be asking, should we actually be concerned or is this just a bunch of doomers thinking about catastrophizing, so on? Well, 
I think, yes, we should be concerned, um, but I'll let you come to that conclusion for yourself and maybe you want a second opinion. So in the online document, you'll find some more notes, some more links to different figures and statistics that showcase the state of the situation. Um, and of course, those numbers are cherry picked. So the, the, the idea is not to give you a sense of everything on this one slide and, and a balanced take, but it is to show you that there are reputable institutions out there that you can check out through the links um, that are identifying risk and paying attention to it. Similarly, the, the next slide is a link to five different reports of the handful, maybe hundreds that are that are out there publicly available from well-established institutions that are also monitoring risk and crises and are paying attention to the meta crisis. Part two, the theory of the meta crisis. So one of the quotes that Daniel Schmachtenberger likes to use is from Charles Kettering, who said, a problem well-defined is a problem half solved. So with this next section, I wanna take a succinct attempt at trying to define the meta crisis. So what is it? To me, the meta crisis is a concept that identifies the underlying interconnectedness of the global crises and catastrophic risks of our time and highlights the delicate dilemma of solving them all without generating more harm. So there's two key pieces there. One is this idea of there being underlying forces, the deep rooted dynamics that generate risk and crisis. And the other is there this dilemma of trying to solve those risks, but doing so without creating more harms. So there's this quote I have on the left from Terry Patton, who basically says there's a bunch of things that you might think of as the meta crisis, but it is not any one of them. It is not just a psychological crisis, not just a spiritual crisis, not just the breakdown of community, family, etc., and it's not just government, economics, and finance failing. It is all of these things and not just one of them. Um, the term meta or the prefix meta refers to a lot. It refers to many, it refers to between, it refers to behind, after, and so on. And I think that is really the, the benefit of this term in itself is that it captures the depth of the crisis as opposed to the polycrisis, which just says there are many crises if you're if you're using the etymology of the word whereas the meta crisis speaks to something much deeper um and maybe a bit of a tangent but when facebook changed their name i think that was uh so disappointing for us losing this very valuable prefix that is now going to be associated with facebook so what are these underlying forces of the meta crisis this is one of the key pieces to the meta crisis that makes it different from all those other terms that i mentioned before and these underlying forces are usually called generative dynamics so i made this dense definition here myself so i'm going to read it directly generative dynamics are a term that refers to the complex systems directing human activity that manifest as embedded obligations, economic incentives, and predispositions of humans and the structure of our civilization. These systems or dynamics continue to perversely and pervasively influence decision-making in a way that ignores many things like scarcity, planetary boundaries, and the value of unmonetized or sacred things. This definition can be broken down further, saying that what I mean by humans and the structure of our civilization is cognitive bias, is sort of inbuilt ways of thinking that might be biologically driven or sort of accumulated through uh, societal anthropogenic forces over time. 
Um, but these are deeply built into the structure of our civilization. Planetary boundaries is a term I probably want to spend more time understanding, but what I get from it is that it makes the point that there are fragile, necessary conditions for safe life on Earth, for us to be able to live on the planet, for other uh, species to live on the planet uh, safely without it being uninhabitable. Next one, value of unmonetized things or unmonetized beings. This is pointing to the idea that we over-quantify, over-engineer. We make everything a system of numbers and maybe science. And what that does is it ignores the ineffable. It ignores sacred aspects of life that maybe we value as individual humans, but collectively in the system that we've designed, it is not valued. And so Daniel often uses this example of a whale is worth more dead than alive. And that's the notion that we only care about its economic monetized value as opposed to maybe the flourishing and survival of the species. Resource scarcity, um, this is the notion that there are limits to growth, that we only have so much oil, uranium, lithium, clean water, arable land, so on. But this perpetual growth of the economy of GDP always going up is ignoring the fact that we have these limitations. Okay, so that definition is a mouthful and I've, I've tried to break it down further, um, but let's talk about specifically what the three, or the way I've characterized them, the three generative dynamics are. So the generative dynamics of anthropogenic risk can be characterized in a few different ways. Um, the first one here is built-in competition inciting rivalous conduct. So this is the idea of competition being sort of unfettered and creating purse incentives towards a bunch of game theoretic outcomes. Stuff like first mover advantages, where you might expect another party, another nation state, another individual to do something exploitative, to take from the commons, whatever it may be. And so with that expectation, you decide to move first, to innovate first, to invest in R&D first so that you get there before them, making it a sort of conflict competition dynamic. This is part of why arms races happen, why countries are competing to first get to AI super intelligence, why countries competed for nuclear armament, so on. It creates um, secret deceptive pra practices amongst not only nations, but amongst people where we maybe are competing against each other for jobs, for networking, for in the case of just relationships, like competing for a relationship. And this idea of rivalry rivalrous conduct is just so pervasive and not only the structure of our civilization, but in the culture itself. And we continue to fall into traps uh, like the ones that are exemplified with the example of the prisoner's dilemma or the tragedy of the commons. Um, next one, growth obligations fueling exponential extraction. So similarly to the first one, which you could argue is partly because of capitalism, not wholly, but it is uh, incentivized in part by the fact that we have market-based economies. Growth obligations is also due to the world financial system. We have an embedded obligation for GDP to always go up, for there to always be a return on capital, to, to have a ROI, a return on investment. And in a way, um, each of us individually should not be faulted for pursuing those growth factors or the, that return on investment because we have to keep up with inflation. If we don't surpass the rate of inflation, then the currency that we use, the, the medium of exchange that we use to get things of value for survival, um, our money will 
be debased, devalued by inflation unless we invest in savings or forms of return. So this obligation creates that dynamic of an expectation and, and a necessity of growth. Um, it also creates good things, which is incentivizing technological progress. We wouldn't have venture capital and risk capital but being put forward for innovation and creating new services and new businesses if it wasn't for this dynamic, but it is also introducing harmful innovations. And so I talked before about harmful tech design, the idea of social media being exploitative and manipulative, and we're getting things like algorithmic polarization. Um, that is because of this narrow optimization for growth metrics as opposed to a lot of the other things that we might value. Uh, furthermore, growth obligations ignore the limits to growth, ignore resource scarcity. And so we get exponential extraction, where as the population increases, the expectation for GDP growth goes up, all of these factors come together to create a exponential ex extraction from the biosphere which only has so much that it can handle. Um, and I guess the last piece in here is that culturally and regulation wise, uh, we are not equipped to put in place structures that prevent growth and competition and extraction from going too far. Uh, last one, structural bias and information compression, perpetuating disunity, resistance, and institutional inertia. This one is also a mouthful. I think it's best represented by the distinction from Dave Snowden on complicated versus complex systems. So when I think complicated, I think of an airplane. You can have a blueprint for an airplane, and although not any one person involved with its manufacturing could tell you how the whole thing is created. They know their piece and each person in the whole has their part. It is represented in a static blueprint and you could always use that same process to recreate another airplane. You cannot use the same kind of documentation dynamic of the whole being made up of its parts in a complex system complex systems and also chaotic systems are much more dynamic, interconnected, and they are not static. The representations of them really relate to that idea of a map is not the territory because we can only capture one lens, one perspective of a complex system in retrospect, but it will be the next second later different from what we've captured it as. And so examples of this is weather patterns. We still cannot predict the weather. Um, and that is because it's a complex system involving many, many aspects of the planet. Um, so with this distinction between complicated and complex, we as a civilization, as a human species, are seemingly unable to really appreciate complexity. We're really good at complicated, and that is the way we've built our institutions. We've increasingly introduced managerial layers, and we've we've grown um, our civilization structure to be as great as it is. But we don't appreciate complexity. We don't appreciate ecology. We don't appreciate the ways in which we can't reduce everything to a static representation and that there are so many other things in the world, in the universe, beyond our current scientific comprehension. But unfortunately, our institutional processes, our business expectations, our government uh, information requirements compresses complexity or forces us to compress complexity and uncertainty into punchy, confident, certain statements, perpetuating disunity, resistance, and institutional inertia because we just continue to repeatedly neglect the fact that there are complex systems beyond human uniqueness and um, 
I suppose, uh, hubris. So these three generative dynamics together are doing what we call subsume the substrate. That's degrading the sociocultural, informational, and natural environments that we depend upon. If you think back to the slide I had on the compounding risk factors, that was the systemic vulnerabilities, the coordination constraints, and the total risk accelerants. These are the dynamics that have created those compounding risk factors. And then thereby, those compounding risk factors are preventing us from solving these generative dynamics. Um, I also want to note that potentially the way I've represented these as three different items captured the way they are is not a perfect representation because they are all interrelated and the sort of solution to the meta crisis is not solving each one of these independently because you would still have the other two and the whole thing the whole system would still come around again and subsume our initiatives and our efforts to solve just one of these so it's really important that we don't use this static representation here the generative dynamics and the meta crisis itself is in a way a complex system um, and we have to think about how we can nudge, make changes to our civilization in a way that is systemic and will address all of these things at once. All right, so maybe you're hearing me, you, you've heard me go through all three of those, but it still feels a little abstract, a little unclear. So in the online document, I have three more slides going really in depth into a bunch of different concepts that I think categorically relate to each of these three different generative dynamics. It's important to note that I could probably have shifted some of them around. Um, for example, like zero sum thinking or Moloch, maybe that could be included in growth obligations and some of the items in growth obligations could be included under competition, so on. These are all very interrelated, they are not mutually exclusive, so keep that in mind. But there's a lot more here to understand to really unpack what's going on with these generative dynamics. And I also want to note that this is the most recent part of the presentation that I've completed. So in related to that the, um, experiment that I want to run with you, with this audience, to do a bit of collective intelligence, I would also encourage you to look particularly at these three slides and help me figure out what I've missed, maybe what I've prioritized to be on the page that should be booted off in place of something that is um, more prominently a feature of one of these generative dynamics. And also help me find some examples, some microcosms, some, some sourcing for what I've described here to really help paint the picture of these abstract co concepts in practice. All right, and the final slide here in part two on the metacrisis is this dialectical dilemma. The dilemma between the vector of disorder leading us towards an outcome of chaos and the vector of control leading us towards the outcome of oppression. So this one on the right hand side is everything I've been talking about. This is the generative dynamics, the risks, the global challenges, and so on, leading us towards potentially accelerating disaster, widespread suffering, societal disarray, and existential events. Coming up against that vector is our collective effort to control the chaos. But we have to be conscious of this effort potentially going too far and becoming totalizing efforts to control the whole world, leading to a situation of oppression, a centralized authority, a global tyranny, a dystopic injustice, or maybe even AGI dominance. The Civilization Research Institute team talks about this idea of a third attractor, and this would be represented by outcome three, global coordination and flourishing. To get there, we have to manage these two competing vectors of change, finding the middle path towards coordination and flourishing. I, I think the 
right hand side is probably understood and appreciated based on what I've been talking through. But the left hand side um, in this presentation, but also more broadly in society, I don't know if it is really appreciated enough. And although there are some tribes that do understand this and maybe take it too far, I, I want to paint a better picture of why we should um, be concerned about this vector. The character of the oppression and control vector is China and the CCP and the possibility of them taking over the world, um, superseding US hegemony. And potentially that's a dystopic situation we don't and the world doesn't want to be in. Um, but beyond just China, there is more to this vector. So I want to read two quotes from the CRI website. The first goes like this. Without thoughtful planning and action, a society will naturally decay into an oppressive or chaotic state. This is the normal failure mode of political culture. The ancient Greeks called it the kyklos, or the cycle of government. It goes from aristocracy to democracy to tyranny. And it has been observed repeatedly throughout history. So I think this really points to the notion that there is not something unique about today, although there are many things unique about today, namely the global interconnectedness of the world, it is not unique that civilizations will have a tendency to veer towards oppression. The second quote goes like this. The rule of law backed up by the state's monopoly of violence is a fundamental feature of both open and closed societies. The difference is that in an open society, the law is an expression of the will of the people through voting rather than an expression of the will of a powerful minority. Global catastrophic risks in an age of rapid tech development demand a kind of ongoing dynamic management if they are to be avoided. This management can either be imposed by an oppressive government or enacted by the will of the people. All right, so maybe now you're asking either you know, does the world burn down or are we going to lose it to a dystopic global ruler? How do you have any hope? Are you preparing yourself and us a bunker? No, I am not. And I have hope. And in part three, I will talk through why. Part three, promising vectors of change. So this next section is mostly my own thoughts on what gives me hope and why I think we shouldn't let the meta crisis bring us to nihilism, despair, or hedonism. So I could have spent probably more time here, and, and I think that is one of the things I want to do in the future. But this is my sense of our collective evolving response and the arc of change. Um, I wanted this slide to almost articulate why I have hope. Um, it starts with the fact that COVID-19 has really accelerated the way the world in coming to understand the ways in which there are systemic risks that we need to care for in unison collectively. And I think fortunately, we are not starting from scratch. There are a lot of organizations and institutions and decades of research that will inform what we do next. So where I think we are is some known problems, but total risk is continuing to intensify. That said, I think what we're doing is growing, amounting, and shared recognition of urgent neglected problems. And finally, where we're going is a shift in our way of life, whether voluntarily, which I think it will be, or all involuntarily, which it might be if we don't do it intentionally. So, you know, I think there's been a lot of increases in talk around the SDG goals, around sustainable finance, and trying to bring more dollars, both private and public, towards 
natural disasters, human rights issues, humanitarian issues, and so on. And that, although it's not solving the meta crisis holistically, it is an important piece of this puzzle. We also have decades of research from institutions informing policy, informing, informing our understanding of risk, both anthropogenic and natural. And we have this growing recognition of catastrophic risks themselves, um, I think especially in groups like effective altruism, which I mentioned in the second column. So what's going on here is a diverse array of many, many impact-minded social movements are sprouting up. And I'm sure I could have included many more. Um, I have long-termism, veganism, solar punk, the 2000 Watt Society, DeFi, ReFi, and I'm not necessarily endorsing any one of them. I do think each may have their drawbacks, but the fact that there is this plurality of impact-minded people trying to find ways, experimenting and innovating on how we might bring about change, potentially systemic change, that is giving me hope. And even this audience watching this is giving me hope that we are paying attention to the meta crisis. Finally, where we're going, I think, is probably most captured by the generative dynamics, which, although that is the term I've used today, and the term that is used within the meta crisis theory, I don't think it's the only way to recognize the fact that there are deep rooted, deep rooted underlying systemic drivers of risk and crisis. And so there is this budding earnest development of new models for economics, for governance, for decision making globally that will maybe help us bring together major world powers, major institutions to actually put in place the systemic change that we need to solve these global issues. The key challenge here will be navigating this intergenerationally in a way that is ethical and sensible. So in the online document, I have two other slides. Um, one, I've got a whole number of logos from organizations that are inspiring me that are working on either you know one particular risk risk domain catastrophic risk or crisis or are working on a horizontal function trying to improve institutional decision making trying to improve governance models trying to reinvent um, economics and there are also a number of hyperlinks on that slide to even longer lists that you could check out if you're looking for further reading for volunteer opportunities or even potential employment um, the next slide i am not including but is uh, online is existential hope visions of the future this is drawing from a number of different sources but namely the existentialhope.com website, which I found to be a really awesome resource for a positive stance um, where you know the meta crisis is a bit more doom and gloom. Existential Hope is trying to look at, hey, what are the ways in which we might come through this current era and use technology for collective good? So there's uh, five of, maybe not my favorite, but really interesting examples of what the future could look like that I linked there, uh, a number of different sources that inspired how I chose to articulate it on that slide, and I encourage you to check those out. Um, so you might be saying, you know, that's all really inspiring. You can see this arc of change that I'm talking through, and a lot of these organizations give you hope, but still asking what can you do individually? And this is a question that comes a uh, comes up a lot. I think it's an important question, one that I have asked myself. Um, and so I have some thoughts on this. So there's three things that I think we can do right away, individually. And I've probably ordered them in importance. As denizens of Earth, I think we all have a part to play in the long arc of change. It's an arc of change that I think will be intergenerational, but that does not mean we don't have a part to play in this. And so the first of the three things is improving ourselves and cultivating personal sovereignty. I might even say this is, you know, the only one you need to do because 
if you succeed at this, I think the rest will certainly follow. So there's a few ideas captured in here. Um, one being the notion of self-deception, which is something that John Verveke talks a lot about. <clears throat> and I have this quote here on the right, which really captures this idea. Um, John says, the very processes that make us intelligent problem solvers and make us so adaptive are also the very same processes that make us prone to self-deceptive, self-destructive behavior. And I think this quote can be illustrated with the contrast of the word bias and the word heuristic. In a way, they're referring to the same thing, where heuristic is the idea of our intuition applied positively or productively, um, and bias is the idea of our intuition applied negatively. So it's important to learn about these biases, also understand in which context they might be heuristics, might be useful intuition, but for the most part, individually and more broadly societally, we have been biased and we have allowed these cognitive biases to run us over, to run amok. Um, I also think to Ian Milgrocrist's work, speaking to the ways in which the left brain hemisphere has sort of dominated, dominated our way of thinking. So I encourage you to check out the 50 forms of cognitive bias that I've linked here, as well as the uh, project called the Inner Development Goals, which captures, you know, as a uh, contribution similar to the SDGs. We have the IDGs capturing not the hard skills or not the cause areas, but the soft skills that globally, culturally, we will need to develop to respond to the meta crisis and overcome it. Um, and in a way, I feel like the 23 skills within the IDGs is like the ideal person I want to hire and I want to see on someone's resume to know that they're the type of person that I think could contribute positively without myopic short-term biases, without too much cognitive bias, um, in a way that overcomes those or integrates those intuitions into uh, a better way of acting. Number two is don't be robotic. Resist the pers perverse incentives, which are the generative dynamics, and they produce externalities if you don't re resist them. So question the inertia of the status quo, challenge the longstanding assumptions around you and examine the ethics of your incentives. And this is not me encouraging you to be contrarian for the sake of being contrarian, but this is saying, don't just follow the crowd, question your assumptions and assess if what you're doing is actually your own agency is your own personal sovereignty and this is how it relates to the first item it's that you want to make the decisions for you that is in alignment with your values and your integrity and not with the values that we've somehow embedded into the structure of our economy which is ignoring so many other things that i think each of us do value and would totally talk about the ways in which we value it, but ignore in service towards metrics that we've quantified in the economy. So, you know, ask yourself these questions I have here to refrain from a winner's take all mentality, to transcend myopic growth obligations, and hopefully avoid information compression, acknowledging uncertainties around complexity. Finally, the last thing I think we can do individually in whatever context you're in is help yourself, help your families, help your clients, help your companies navigate the imminent economic effects of the meta crisis. So these are all ways in which the meta crisis is becoming really real, is impacting our day to day. And I've only listed five things here, such as the disruption to our ability to comprehend and receive information, as well as our ability to share and communicate information, the changing economic and regulatory playing field, 
um, domiciliation, meaning where would you want to live, where would corporations want to operate, um, increasing cybersecurity risks. All of these things are on the horizon or are happening today. And these are specific aspects that you can focus on that are much more tangible than maybe some of the abstract intellectual ideas associated with the meta crisis. And these are things that would truly help you and those around you navigate the world. Okay, finally, this concept of cathedral thinking, uh, an idea that I really like and think we could use a lot more of in the world. Now, the tagline here I've, I've put is, despite our tendencies toward egotism, remember that you're a part of something bigger than yourself. And I haven't really done the research to back up if we do have inexorable tendencies towards egotism, but I think from what I've seen and from my assessment out there, it is something that can happen. It can be a blind spot. And so I want us to remember that it is not just about us individually and us finding meaning individually in our own lives. It is about relating, communing, and collectively being a part of something bigger than us. And I think that is what cathedral thinking um, speaks to me, in addition to the, the core of what it speaks to, which is more long-term thinking. So there's this um, quote that Krishnamurti says that is, is often said around the liminal web space. And it goes, it is no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. And I think that's a really important idea, especially when it seems like around us, um, you may have felt this personally, or you might have seen it happen to people around you. We kind of pathologize people that want to save the world. And I think we shouldn't. I think there's nothing wrong with saving the world. Although these cautions might have some merit too. I think the, as I've said here, the best of intentions aren't always pure. Sometimes these grand visions of saving the world um, can distort our identities and our expectations of what we individually are going to do. And we might overcorrect. We might allow new blind spots to fester as we hypervigilantly focus on just a subset of problems. I think this relates back to narrow goal optimization, to self-deception, and to reductionism, which are some of the terms that I have in the online-only slides that I didn't talk through. So my answer to sort of this this dynamic or this dialectic of maybe going too far to save the world, but still valuing that aim is one of balance. I think if we have the privilege to try and to contemplate these things, yes, we should aim to save the world. But we must realize in both senses of the world, in term, of the word, in terms of an awareness and understanding and appreciation for the idea, but also trying and causing that idea to manifest into being, we must realize the depth of what it means that you alone will not save the world. And so cathedral thinking, I think, is a really cool metaphor, a metaphorical mindset, so to speak, that refers to this idea. It's the notion of medieval workers who began and envisioned the construction of a beautiful monument, a beautiful building that they would probably not see complete in their lifetime. And despite that, they still worked on it with the collective dream of having that exist in the future for future generations. And so I think a lot more people out there could use this kind of mindset. I think all of us, past, present, and future, we are in an intergenerational collaboration. And I think that the arc of change involves us all making shared choices, having those shared choices cascade, and having those shared choices culminate. And I think this presentation, you know, is, is sort of an example of that. I wouldn't be putting this together and I wouldn't be sharing it with you if it wasn't for the shared choice of me talking about this with Peter, 
if it wasn't for the shared choice of Daniel uh, creating podcasts that I've watched and putting it out there so that I could learn about a lot of this and then get connected to other ideas and thinkers in the space that I've tried to condense into here. And Peter and Daniel and all those other reference works that have gone into this, they wouldn't have done what they've done if it wasn't for shared choices around them. And so this isn't an argument against or for free will. My point is concurrently or over time, we are making shared choices. And that means we are in something bigger than ourselves. Okay, thank you. Um, one last thing, as I mentioned, I wanted to run an experiment with the YouTube comments. Hopefully YouTube comments for good, if that's possible. So this is an opportunity for collective intelligence around the Metacrisis and around this presentation. I would love um, your feedback, your critiques, but I would also especially really like um, some of these desirable comments that I have listed here. So real examples of the concepts described, insights on the interconnectedness of risk. I want to know if you have uh, links or references or academic papers, articles, um, experiences anecdotally in your own life that can articulate really tangible microcosms that show how these abstract ideas manifest in real life today. And so if you have ideas and can help me build a better um, body of knowledge on the Metacrisis, then uh, I have a suggested comment format here. So please reference the corresponding page title, um, reference the page number or the concept. Um, please provide a link if what you have is online and then maybe briefly describe why um, your feedback or what you're providing feels important to you. Thank you so much for listening to this talk. Um, I'm really looking forward to your response and I really hope that it helps to crystallize a more full picture of what we mean whenever we say the Metacrisis.